commercial free Catholic charismatic channel. He's strengthening the faith of so many people. To promote the gift of church teaching, dedicated for the new evangelization. God's blessings on your work, may God bless and prosper you. Shalom World, God's own channel. My name is Father Paul Galowski. I am a conventual Franciscan and ministering in St. Paul the Shipwreck Church in San Francisco, California. And in this talk, I would like to share with you my faith journey, my testimony of how I came to be a Franciscan, how I became to fall in love with Jesus and God and be guided by the Holy Spirit. I share it in love because his love compels me. And I believe that all of us sharing our stories helps one another to find a deeper relationship with God. And so I'm going to actually go back to very early in my life and just talk an overview of how I've come to know the Lord. And I think it's a common uh, path that a lot of us take in many different details, but the overall ideas I think are similar. So I was born a Catholic, raised in a Catholic family, and my first experience with God, other than being taught that God exists, was when God answered prayers. And so for a lot of the people I minister to and talk to, answering prayers is one of the ways that God reveals him or herself to be real for us in our lives. And so I remember a long time ago on my first communion day and sitting in the church and the priest said to us, whatever you ask God on this day, it's such a special day that you're receiving your first communion. God will hear and answer that prayer. So what I did is I asked God that my brother Bill would give me his wallet that he had won as reward on his paper route because I had been helping him for two months on his paper route, getting up early in the morning, folding papers, delivering them before we went to school. And he got as a reward a wallet. And uh, he promised to give me that because I helped him, but he never gave it to me. And so I said, Lord, have Bill give me that wallet. So that afternoon when I was in my, our front yard, my father had, us, had me pulling weeds in the front yard, which is how we celebrated any great event, worked. And my brother Bill comes riding down the driveway on his bicycle and he throws the wallet at me and says, Happy First Communion. And so at that moment, I said, Is that really you, God? Did you answer that prayer? And I wasn't really sure, but then three days later, because he was a meaner and very cruel sometimes older brother, <laughs> and we have a great relationship now, but at that time it was tough. And three days later, he took it back and said, Give me that wallet back. And so that's when I really knew that God answered my prayer by changing his heart, even if only for a little while. And so I think in all of our lives, somehow, somewhere, God answers our prayers. And we believe God is really real. And we pray to God for things that we want. And for many, uh, sometimes our faith kind of stays there. But I really believe, as I look back, that God answers our prayers, oftentimes very insignificant prayers like the wallet, not with the real purpose of giving us what we ask for, but so that we will know that he's real. As I grew, um, the next thing that in my life is, is significant is I remember very much believing that God had a moral code and a way that we're called to live. And we're all taught that we needed to live and follow the commandments and the teachings of God. And I remember early on, again, in my uh, grade school days, is we had a fair at the parish. And at the fair, it was a fundraiser, they had a raffle. And they reach in and reach, buy, pay 25 cents for three tickets. You reach in and pull a ticket out. And if it's the right number of one of the prizes on the wall, you win the prize. Well, I didn't have any money that day, and so I knew I was doing something wrong, but I snuck up in the crowd and reached in and pulled, put my hand in the, in the 
jar and pulled out a ticket and it was the winning ticket and immediately I started feeling really guilty that I had done something wrong and I took because I didn't feel that good I picked one of the smaller prizes a radio transistor radio when I brought it home tried it out it was broken and it didn't really work and so I started believing then at my, this point that simple example that God has a moral code that we're called to live by and when we don't do that uh, things go wrong very simple example but as I grow I remember pursuing truth and recognizing that you shouldn't tell a lie because ultimately we're called to find out what life is all about and we can't really find out what life is all about until we really discover the truth and, and pursue the truth. And I believe if we really pursue truth, God reveals himself and the, the significance of life. And then also I remember in high school through dating relationships and uh, men and women dating, boys and girls and people getting pregnant, and children and abortions and starting to see that even though I was involved in that kind of attitude that the world had taught me that there's a very grave evil about it and that we're really called to follow God's commandments and until we really do that it's not so much that we're doing it because God will punish us uh, punish us but it's really ultimately out of love and God cannot really dwell and show us a deeper relationship until our lives conform to his moral teachings of love really which are ways we love one another and so God has so much more planned for us to reside in us and lead us to great things but until we really act in accord with love even if it's not coming from the internal expression we must conform our lives so that God can give us that indwelling of the Holy Spirit and that it won't be grieved by our life's patterns but as my life went on I moved away from graduated from college moved away to Los Angeles California from Detroit Michigan and began a new life very much in the world working for a living and I remember very much um, feeling empty I'd stopped going to church very much pursuing a career, trying to make a lot of money, and there's lots of pressures. But in a new community, in a very busy community, I didn't have the same connections of family and friends. And so I remember driving home on my bicycle one day and thinking to myself, you know, back when I was at home, I would park my car at my grandmother's house, walk home, and talk to a lot of people and our lives are connected but here in this big city nobody knows me and if I died in my apartment no one would even know it until the landlord noticed his rent wasn't being paid they'd come in and find this smelly body and so I remember having that very reflection that driving my bike on the way coming back into my apartment and when I came back into my apartment I remember he, he I had left the radio on and there was a commercial on the radio for a Catholic Big Brothers program and what that is, it's a mentorship program where you volunteer to be involved in the life of a young man who doesn't have a father. And I remember bringing the bicycle into that room, and as the words of that commercial came out of those speakers, suddenly something very powerful happened. The words just started floating in the air, and all time just kind of slowed down. And so I very much felt that something was calling me to give of myself and be involved in another person's life. And so I volunteered to become a Catholic Big Brother. I actually went through the training. And I remember um, when they presented me with three different possibilities of people they could match me up with, um, I said, that's the one. And if I really felt a strong, compelling, strong feeling telling me to pick that one and the social worker said well that one doesn't make sense because he doesn't have any of the things you've mentioned you like to do like sports and stuff like that and I said well that's the one he goes well that's good because he's older and he wouldn't get picked until unless you picked him because we were going to take him out of the system and so he was 12 years old at the time and we matched up and so I, I would spend every Saturday with him for for eight years straight and to this day we're still best of friends and I'm a mentor in his life and I've gone and married him and uh, working on baptizing his child um, so it's been a very powerful experience but that was really one of the first experiences where something outside of myself called me to get more involved and I didn't even identify it with God 
just a need to be uh, involved in other people's lives. And so in that time of my life when I was still searching and away from church, um, I talked to my father and I said, you know, Lord, not Lord, Father, I know there's something going on in my life, uh, yearning to do something more. This stuff you told me about God, it seems like it's something I should pursue. Can you recommend something I should read? And he says, read The Imitation of Christ. And so I got a copy of that book and for months I was carrying that book with me wherever I went and read it and read it. And so something in that book was really speaking to me. And I started to go to church more and more, and not always, but, and as I went to church, I found that something mysteriously fed me. And so I got more involved in church and pursuing God. And then one day in church, there was a magazine called the Ligorian Magazine, which they said uh, you can sign up for. So I got that. And in that book, in that magazine, many of the articles started to speak to me and they suggested other things to read. And so I started reading a lot. And then I started going on retreats a lot. And then I started getting more involved in the church. And one time, my pastor, um, Father Alexander at uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe Church, a Franciscan church, recognized my yearning and he said, you need a spiritual director. And so he taught me how to pray. And he taught me how to pray by reading the Gospels and putting myself in the position of the different persons in the Gospels. And so by the, before you pray, you ask for the Holy Spirit to truly be with you. And then put yourself in the place of Jesus and try to hear the sound, see the vision, smell the smells, understand the emotions that different characters are going through. And one that you can pray with a particular passage. And for one whole hour, for example, you can be just that one person. And then after you kind of experience the scene, to start to journal. What is the message? And over time, and then on different days, you can be a different person in the scene and stick with the whole passage for like a whole week. And that way of praying, over time, it started to help me understand how to look at my life and the world from the point of view of the Gospels and Christ. And so I started growing in a relationship with the Lord that was more profound and more real than just God exists, God answers our prayers, there's a moral code, but it was something that really fed me. And then I, I was also blessed to have a roommate who was a non-Catholic Christian, but he was a very faithful person, very involved in his church. And as I watched his life, and how he depended on God for everything. Even things like when he didn't have enough money to get something that he really needed, he'd write the check and then pray, and then suddenly the check would get cleared even though he didn't have sufficient funds. Things like that, but the way he so based his entire life, and the way he spent all day in church on Sundays, and how he was involved in the ministries. And that gave a great witness to me. And then I started running at many other non-Catholic Christians who often ask that question, are you saved? Are you saved? Um, do you have a personal relationship with the Lord? And so all these things were happening. And then one day on a retreat um, that the pa parish I was going to, it was a curseal, asked me to attend and sponsored me. And the priest, Father Alex, said, I'm going to be praying for you the whole time when you're on that retreat. And while I was on that retreat, it didn't seem like the retreat was really all that great. But then one of the speakers, his name was John. And John couldn't talk very well because he had a stroke and part of his face and his mouth was paralyzed. But you could understand him, but he could say only a few words. And what he said to us is that he actually died and met Jesus, and Jesus told him it's all about love. And then he was allowed to come back to earth, and that's what he's been doing is testifying through this curseal and other, every opportunity he had to, to show the experience of love that he had with God. And so after that talk, I was a little skeptical and we had a break. And so in that break, I'm sitting under a tree and he starts walking by. And I remember saying, I got to go talk to him because that sounds really a little hard to believe. But I wasn't uh, antagonistic. I was just ser really curious because that type of love, that type of relationship with Jesus is something that I knew I longed for. And so I went up to him and started to say, is that really true that you died and saw Jesus? 
And as I was saying that, someone else came up and asked a very similar question, but did it from a very antagonistic point of view. Whereas I thought I was doing it from a, a longing, a hungering point of view. And so I remember he turned to him, and in his very hard to speak words, because his mouth was paralyzed, said, it's all about love you don't understand. And then he turned to me and said, it's all about love you understand. And the moment he said that, a powerful love, feeling of love, came over me that just melted my heart. And it was, I believe, being taken up into heaven, if you will, but it was a true experience of a profound love that changed my heart and my life. And from that moment on, God has been something very powerful and very real in my life that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt is real and fulfills me, takes away that hunger and that emptiness, and fills me with a desire to express that love in all ways, but ultimately by giving my life really back to God. And so I remember driving home from the retreat that day uh, thinking about what had happened, and I got my hands on the steering wheel, and I'm just thinking, Lord, and I'm feeling it, not so much thinking it, is I have no choice, like when someone hits your knee and it goes up, I have no choice but to give my love, life totally to you. And so I took my hands off the wheel without even realizing what I was doing and said, Lord, whatever you want, I will do. And so here I am, car moving, no hands on the steering wheel. I think that's a good symbol of really how life has gone since then. And so my only goal and focus has been to serve the Lord and to do God's work. And so you see how I think my life has transferred, trend, uh, progressed from God answering my prayers to really me trying to answer God's prayers. And God's prayer is in John chapter 17 that all people come to know Christ and experience his love and we're united. And so it was shortly after that, I go back to the parish, which is a Franciscan parish, and they get me more involved, of course, and they can see something's different. And one day I, um, at work, I just told my boss I needed six months off work to reevaluate my life because I, I recognized I was working so much, it was like a god to me. And it was preventing me from truly serving the Lord. So I took six months off work, and during that time, reevaluated my life and really worked with a book called What Colors Your Parachute, which helps you understand God's call is really to look at your gifts and your talents and develop them and ask yourself, how can my gifts and talents best serve the world according to God's view? And so I was trying to do that, and I had actually planned to go be a volunteer with the Christian Brothers in New York City to uh, work in a high school to teach uh, a vocational class and music because I was playing the guitar at the time and also I was an engineer and so I could work a vocational program working with kids that got kicked out of the New York public school system to train them to be placed in industry. But as I got more and more involved in the parish and I was running a young adult group, I was in the choir and I was um, on the parish council, so I had a mailbox at the parish. And so one day after Mass, it was Vocation Sunday. And the priest got up, and it was even a priest I didn't like that much. And he got up and talked about how great it was to be a Franciscan. And something again, you know, just like those words from the radio, just like that experience of love, something really connected as he was talking. And I said to myself, Lord, if this Christian Brothers thing falls through in New York, uh, I, I'll try the Franciscans. And as I got back up and went into the choir, the choir director even looked at me and said, was that homily meant for you? And I went over to the mailbox after the parish and there was vocation literature there for the Franciscans. And so I wrote it in my journal, Lord, if the Christian Brothers falls through, I will then join the Franciscans. Three days later, I get a call from the Christian Brothers saying, everything was approved. Uh, you know, the school really wants you, but the place where you're going to live, they decided they don't have room for another volunteer because one of the volunteers decided to stay on another year. So we don't really have a place for you. Do you want us to look for something else? And I said, no, I think that answers the call. And so I became a Franciscan, and I've been a Franciscan for 20 years now. And during that time, again, my life continues to grow. It's not easy, but it's always a focus of God's love is so real and how can I express that love? And I can 
testify in many of ministry, working in people's lives, the power of miraculous healings, inspiration in words, either in homilies and sermons or outside in counseling. And my life has in many ways been more a walk in the Holy Spirit. And I really kind of experienced my life much more now as pulling down power from heaven or administering the very power that God has given us in Christ Jesus to heal others, to bring them to the Lord, rather than really answering my prayers. Uh, just a, a good example of how I think life is for all of us, really, the model. As I'm a pastor of the church now, and I've never been pastor before, and the maintenance of the facilities is a huge issue. And as I became aware of many of the problems in the parish and recognizing that we need literally a half million dollars to fix all these problems. I started to become very overwhelmed. How are we going to raise all this money and how am I going to do this and how am I going to do that? And then one day walking into the office, again, that as insider, that spirit came over me and said, you know, this church is over 100 years old. The church is 2,000 years old. I am in control of the church. You really don't have to worry. Just do my work. And so I think for all of us, if we're really truly about doing God's work because we've got that relationship with Him, it does take away a lot of the worries. Uh, we don't have to be successful. We just have to be faithful. We don't have to have all the answers. We just have to depend on God. And I have to keep telling myself that over and over. But over the years, uh, I've been very blessed to be able to serve the Lord and have found that His love is very real. And being faithful to that love is really our call. And so over the 13 years now that I've been a priest, my faith journey has continued to grow and I've been much more, I believe, open to the Holy Spirit. And uh, like I shared, um, again, being a pastor and working in a church, it's often the temptation to take a lot of the burdens upon yourself and to feel very overwhelmed with a lot of the responsibilities. And so one time about three or four years ago, I remember being sick, and so that made me feel especially down, but having many responsibilities and then being unable to do them, and so having to call on the phone lots of people to try to get substitutes, and it became an overwhel a symbol of how my life was such a difficult attempt to try to satisfy so many needs, but I was failing because I wasn't quite up to the task. And I remember that evening laying on my bed in the fetal position, like a little baby, saying, crying out to the Lord, saying, Lord, you've got to help me. Um, and the next day the phone rings, and it's a minister I had met um, over the last couple of years, actually his father was dying and I journeyed with him uh, and met, got to met him, meet him and know him during that process. And um, he said, the Lord told me to call you. <laughs> and I go, what? I was, yeah, I was crying out last night. And so we talked and ever since that time we've been prayer partners together. And one of the things that uh, has happened is that he's kind of helped me and many others to become more open to the Holy Spirit. And I believe uh, one time he prayed for a baptism in the Spirit. And a baptism in the Spirit is something that uh, I don't know a lot about, but from St. Paul's letter to Timothy, Timothy 1 and 2, he talks about it more as a stirring up of the Spirit, a stirring up of the gift that was imparted when God laid his hands upon you. And so I remember him praying that that gift would be stirred up and that sometime today I would feel an anointing of the Holy Spirit to kind of give me a new strength in my ministry. And I remember being at the revival of the local church um, nearby. It was a Friday night, I believe. And at the end of the revival, we were all holding hands, praying together. And I remember just kind of feeling and even seeing in my mind an image of light, rain, or mist coming upon me and a real, another peace. And ever since that time, my preaching and my ministry has been a lot more authoritative and I believe really grounded in the Holy Spirit. And so I think God is again teaching me how to trust more in God, how to be a more of a vessel. And it really is true that God has given us the power in Christ Jesus, right? When he said, go out and preach the gospel, cast out evil, um, take nothing with you for the journey, but know that I am always with you. 
he really has given great power and he says signs will accompany the preaching and so more and more I've been open to that and uh, I have seen great great things happen in the ministry when we're really focused on doing it for the Lord and believing that we actually have a real power and so I recently went on a 30-day spiritual retreat, 30-day retreat um, at a Benedictine monastery in Oceanside, California, Prince of Peace Monastery, and I did a 30-day Ignatian spiritual exercises. And um, one of the things I did is uh, later on in the retreat, fasted for uh, a period of time, and only about 40 hours, and. A um, little over a day, so maybe only about 30 hours. But I remember after that time of fasting, reading the scriptures one more time, and I was reading John chapter 15, 16, where it says, Jesus says to his disciples, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I chose you and commissioned you to go and bear fruit. And so whatever you ask in Jesus' name will be granted. And as I read those, that scripture passage, it became very clear to me that the Lord was really speaking and given us and all of his ministers, but given me power to really do great things in the Lord's name. But I also remembered, and it was powerful too, is that word fruitful. And that as I look back at my journey, back in the days right after college, when I really wasn't going to church that much, I was just coming back to church and feeling fed. I remember having gone to Mass one day, then going over and visited my aunt and uncle. And they were not believers, they were not practicing the faith, and so they were kind of expecting me, a young man, to get married, and they were always pressuring me, when are you going to get married, and stuff like that. And she said, my aunt said, what did, uh, what did, so you went, what did you do today? So I went to church, and she went, oh yeah, well, what did the priest say? And it was the gospel passage about the tree being fruitful, and if it wasn't fruitful one year, fertilize it and dig around it and give it one more year. And I said to her, you know, I really feel like I want to be fruitful, and I'm not being fruitful, and God's calling me to be fruitful. And she laughed because she thought, finally, this young man thinks he should get married. But I didn't, and I ended up being fruitful, as we're all called to be fruitful in whatever way God calls us. But I recognized that God had really answered that prayer from 10, 20 years ago uh, that I wanted to be fruitful in the kingdom of God. It's brought me to this point and given me and us great power to do great things in Jesus' name for the good of the kingdom in love. And so with that kind of authority given to us by God, with that faith and knowledge of God's love, we are called to call on God's authority make Jesus present truly in the world, spread the gospel, that, and signs will accompany it. But ultimately, like John said, it's all in that retreat, it's all about love, and it's about sharing God's love. And so really our baptismal call, as when we are baptized, we go under the water, and that's supposed to be a sign of burial, death to ourselves, and so when we rise up out of the water, I'm alive, this new life. And then we're anointed with the oil. And the oil says, share in the ministry of Christ. As Christ was a priest, prophet, and king, so too are you to share in that ministry. And that really is all of our call. We are priests, and a priest is one who makes the presence of Jesus, pre makes Jesus present in our world. And so we are called by our relationship with the Holy Spirit living in us to really just make Jesus present. And so when we sit with another in love and show them that compassion, we're making Jesus present. We're called to be prophets. We're called to speak his words. Words have great power. And those words can heal people and direct people and, and correct people in love. And so we're called to be prophets. And we're also called to be kings. To me, this is less obvious, but a king is someone who's concerned about the welfare of all, the whole kingdom. And so all of us have a commitment and a, a responsibility to look at all God's people, our family, our church, our society, and act in ways that build up the kingdom of God, bringing God's love to all people, justice being the minimum requirement of love, but to spread the gospel, to proclaim the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so that is our call, priests, prophets, and kings by virtue of our baptism.
teach everything he commanded them to teach. New ways to communicate God's word. Present positive images to our people. This message of truth and salvation. Culture of uh, encounter. Gospel of Christ worldwide. Shalom World TV. Twenty four seven. Faith filled. Dynamic. Virtue building. Commercial free. Family friendly. Catholic charismatic channel to the whole world. Promote the gift of church teaching. Dedicated for the new evangelization. Mentor the young into a deeper embrace of the Catholic faith. Wonderful contributions to the church. People of prayer. Attractive people, attractive messages. Peace of Christ. Promote the values of life. This is media at its very best. The voice of the church. great love. Taking this to the next step. Shalom World TV. Shalom. 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 Shalom World. God's own channel.